alive. Welcome, everyone. I was saying earlier, I'm drawing the big crowds now. All seven of you. And a half. Seven and a half. We'll count Jackson. So how's everybody doing? Good. I mean, we can have like a little circle conversation here and just have a discussion if you all want to. I won't even teach. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Any prayer requests? I'm going to walk over here because I see a prayer request. What did you do to your foot? Okay, we're just going to pray for her foot. That whatever it is gets better. And we'll just leave it at that. It's been your unspoken for the past several weeks, so we'll just leave it unspoken. And Did you try to teach her to kick a soccer ball? Did you teach her to kick a soccer ball? No. I mean, it would explain a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other prayer requests? Is everybody's week doing just doing that good? We don't even we don't even need the Lord this week. We're just no requests at all. I mean, I do see no knee brace on Amanda this week. She should have it on, but she don't. But that doesn't change the fact that hey, obviously it's doing a little better. Do you need to prop it up still? Are you sure? Well, you know what? Let's just go ahead and just turn this chair now anyway. That way, when you do need it, it's there. Nothing else. Nothing? All right, well, let's, uh, you stay seated. You may also stay seated. She said no, she's not going to stay seated. All right, let's stand and have some prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, the first thing we want to do is just worship you. We want to praise your name. We want to thank you for who you are. We just want to take a moment of our time that it really is your time and just take all the focus off of ourselves, off of our lives, off of the, the busyness that we have going on, the things that we might think are important and we just want to focus on you. We want to think about who you are in our lives, what you've done in our lives and just this wonderful creation that you have put us in. We can't even fathom all that you do and all that you are but in the, the small thinking that we have, we still want to thank you for all of it. We still want to thank you for who you are. And Lord, as we come before you, there are obviously ailments, heartaches, hurts, things that we struggle with. That, Lord, in, in your presence seems small, but still impact our lives in, in ways that we just need you. We just need to leave them with you. We need to understand that you're in control of it. And pray, Lord, that you can just provide us peace in those situations. Lord, I pray that you just you continue to, to lead us and direct us and just show us how we can be a light in a world that needs you more than ever. We just ask these things in your name. Amen. So this week, this, if you have talked to me for more than 10 minutes about anything in the Bible over the past few weeks, I have, whether consciously or subconsciously, just kind of went to this subject. And I've done it so much that I kind of alluded to it in a couple of other messages and a couple of other lessons, and it's just gotten to the point where I decided that it was time to actually give a full-on Lesson on the kingdom. And when we hear the word kingdom in our world today, especially in this country, we think of this old way that countries were ran. We think of a plot of land that was ruled by a king or queen. We hear the word kingdom and we think a noun. Now, for those of you that are a little rusty on your, on your English grammar, 
A noun is a person, place, or thing. And that's what we think of when we hear the word kingdom in our world. It has no action. The dictionary defines kingdom as a country, state, or territory ruled by a king or queen. It's a place that is ruled by a person. But thinking about this, anymore, anytime I read something in Scripture, I often wonder, what's the biblical definition of this word? What's the meaning have when Jesus used it? What did it mean in the Old Testament? What was a kingdom? What is a kingdom? Because it really, in, in the Western world, it's a very foreign concept to us. We don't have kingdoms here. We don't have a king. We have a president that we elect. So it's, it's, this is kind of a, a strange idea to us of kingdom. And so I wanted to kind of take a, a week here and just kind of boil the word down and find out what it really means. And the word itself kind of gives us a view into what the word really boils down to. But to give the answer to that without any context is, is not going to make any sense or it's going to make for a really short lesson. And I have some time to fill up, so I figured I would elaborate a little bit on this idea. So in order for us to really get any context for this, we have to go back to the beginning again. Because in case you haven't been in here very often, I like to start at the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean the very beginning. And we have to find out where the first kingdom was mentioned in the Old Testament. And we find it in Genesis 1, verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You see, God has given Adam a role. He didn't just create him and say, have a good time. He gave him a job. And the word in the dictionary for subdue, this word subdue, what it means is to overcome, to quieten, or bring under control. And I, and I pulled that straight from a, a dictionary. That, that's what this word means. And God has given Adam the task of bringing the earth under control. Nature on its own, it, it'll be perfectly fine. But when Adam is given the task to bring it under control, he's basically being told to cultivate and to manage. This would be the same as an owner of a company telling a manager, hey, get this place under control. Make sure the employees are doing their job. You can't run this thing on autopilot. Make sure my labor costs are down. Make sure my business is being profitable. Anybody here ever manage a, a store or restaurant or anything? We got a, somebody here. I've done it myself. Got one back here. Look, we don't get to just make up the rules. We have to do it the way we are told to do it. It's the vision of the business, the ideas and the principles that the owner gives, but he appoints a manager to see that these things are actually carried out. And this is the story of man. And the story of man is the story of middle management. And this is the task that God has given Adam. Adam was supposed to cultivate and bring the full potential of creation out. And again, nature is going to be fine on its own. If you leave a plot of land alone, it's going to grow grass and trees and vegetation. What's that now? We weren't given dominion over the vegetation. But if you leave this stuff alone, an ecosystem will develop. I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is. But when we cultivate the land, when we subdue the, the wildness of it, we can plant crops that wouldn't produce as much on their own. We can bring the animals under control and make sure that they are healthier, better fed, more productive. And that's, that's the, the job that Adam has been given. 
God says, here's a business. Run it like this. Adam took the company in a different direction. And not a good one. You see, what God created was a place where he could dwell with man. He established a kingdom and basically asked Adam to live and run it. To run the company, you have to, you have to run it the way the owner wants you to. Adam didn't want to run it that way. He wanted to make the rules for himself. And from the fall, we see man trying to rule, trying to define good and evil for themselves. And throughout the first part of the Old Testament, we see civilization of, civilizations of, of man trying to rule. We see man-made cities and kingdoms. And from these man-made cities and kingdoms, themes begin to develop. We can start to see it in the literature of the Old Testament. In one of the first civilizations, you have Adam and Eve. They leave the garden. They have children, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. And then Cain leaves the presence of the Lord. In Genesis 4.17, Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And I feel it's really important for us to really mention he left the presence of the Lord. And the reason I feel it's so important to point this out because when we leave the presence of the Lord and we start to build our own kingdoms, I'll just, I'll just say, have you not read? It turns into a mess. It's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't end well. And just a few generations later, Seven to be exact. He, he made this slide on the background. I'll look at the slides every once in a while and I had to count. I was like, did I really? Is there seven after that one? Seven generations later, we find a character named Lamech. Lamech, he's not a nice guy, but he's running the show. He is running this human establishment, this kingdom of sorts, and he is so evil, he brags about it. In Genesis 4.23, Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. He's proud of this. He's bragging. And from that moment, things just spiral out of control. We have the flood. Then just a few generations later, we have the city of Babylon. And it doesn't take long to see that men aren't capable of ruling themselves. Now, if you were here last week, you're going to notice that there are a lot of parallels in the day of the Lord that we talked about last week in this lesson. Mostly because we're really running through the same stories. Because we have to really get the context of these stories and the ideas in these stories to understand later stories, which was really kind of a, a lot of the idea behind this entire thing was let's go through the Old Testament. Let's understand what it said so we can understand the New Testament. But this lesson closely parallels last week's. In main attempt to define good and evil, we also try to set up kingdoms for ourselves and mimic that definition. Babylon is a theme we see repeated throughout Scripture of human cities and kingdoms that are evil and incapable of defining anything the way the owner and the founder of the company defined it. Maybe that's where we get the term fired. Fire, nobody, got it, somebody at least. Then we finally get to this guy named Abram. God tells Abram to go to a place that he will give him, him and his offspring, and that God will make a nation out of them. And God plans to make a kingdom among men again. Well, there just happened to be a famine in that land. And it seems Abram didn't trust God because 
He journeys to Egypt. And at this time, Egypt is a full-fledged kingdom. And you see, what you have is you have this small civilization that Lamech started, and then you get something a little bit bigger in Babylon, and then we get to Egypt. Egypt is this huge, massive kingdom. And it's rulers, and it has rulers and palaces, and has defined good and evil on their own terms. Abram tells Pharaoh Sarah is his sister, and it causes a bunch of trouble for Pharaoh in Egypt. And, you know, it, it, in that story, I, 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 I don't see where Pharaoh was really being evil. He thought the woman was single. He didn't know he'd done anything wrong. Anyway, he sends him away, and several generations later, the family comes back. Now known as Abraham. Abraham doesn't come back, but his family does. And this theme of human kingdom is always the same. It's a place that has tried to define good and evil for themselves. They fail miserably. And it becomes a place of oppression. So then we have Moses and the Jewish people leave this human kingdom and go to Mount Sinai where God is going to make a covenant with them. He's going to be their king. He's going to be their God, and he's going to establish his reign with this group, and through them the nations will know God. And they will know him as the only true king. Exodus 19.4 You yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant... You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. This is a big clue that this is God's kingdom. All the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. This is God talking to, to Moses. And you shall be a kingdom of priests. And a holy nation. God wanted them to be a nation of priests under his reign. He wanted to define good and evil for them. He wanted to end the oppression of the human kingdoms through them. But as per just about everything the people of Israel did, they complained. We want a king. We want to be like everybody else. Controlled. Confused. And oppressed. And we have this story in, in Samuel chapter 8, and I, and I love the way this plays out. It, again, there's times I wish I had never read the Bible before, and I just got to read this for the first time and, and really understand what, what happens here. 1 Samuel 8, starting in verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge over us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So as we see, God wanted, to, God wanted to be their king. And he, he even gives this whole spiel in the book of Deuteronomy. It's called the Law of the Kings, where he says, don't, don't bring horses in from Egypt. Don't have this big standing army. Don't collect a bunch of gold. And tells them what you're supposed to have. You're supposed to have the Torah. The king was supposed to write out his own version of it, his own copy not his own version, but his own copy of it. And he was supposed to be a priest. Well, that didn't happen. And Samuel's speech that he gives after all this happens really sums up every kingdom and every nation and every country since then. Starting in verse 10. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people 
who were asking for a king for, from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. And he's not saying this is, these are commands that he should do. He's saying, this is what's going to happen. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and your female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to, to his work. He will take a tenth of your flock and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourself. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. Does that sound familiar? Sound like every nation ever? There's a, sorry, sorry, you don't have a slide for this. I'm just going to elaborate a little bit. There's a, a, a movie called Troy, and it's about the, the Trojan horse and all this. Have anybody ever seen this? It's got Brad Penn in it, and he plays Achilles, the great Greek hero. And at the very, very beginning of the movie, there's these two great big armies, and they're about to face off. And, you know, one army calls their champion, and this is a great big man, you know, a thousand foot tall. Big muscles. And the other guy calls out Achilles. And Achilles doesn't want to fight. And, you know, he's just being a snot-nosed brat, basically, because he can be, because he's Achilles. And uh, the king says something to him about, you know, I should have you beat for your, your disobedience. And Achilles goes to walk off, and somebody stops him and says, think of the men. Think of all the lives you're going to say. Achilles turns around and he looks right at that king and he says, imagine a day a king fights his own battles. Because that's not what happens. I'm going to move on from there. This king you are asking for is going to define good and evil for himself and oppress you. It's basically what he's saying here. And this is exactly what happens through Saul than the 40-some kings that come after him. And you say, well, they had David and they had Solomon. Yeah, David started off good. He started off. He didn't end so well. Solomon was the same way. Solomon started off good. And then he had the, as we heard on Sunday, what, what P.T. calls the fade. But the rest of them, most of, most of these kings did a really poor job at running the kingdom. The kingdom. What is the, the kingdom? What is this idea of the kingdom? And I asked at the beginning of this, this lesson, what is the biblical definition for this word? And for us to understand it, we have to do a little word study. That the first part I want to look at is the ending of the word. D-O-M. Dom. You see, what it does is it takes a noun and attaches an idea. It attaches a state of being to it. Like when we hear the word stardom, they have been thrust into stardom. Well, that's a state of them being a star. Somebody on American Idol gets, the winner gets thrown into stardom. It's a state of being. When we hear the word boredom, we think of the state of being bored. Let's bring it a little bit closer to home. Freedom. What does this word freedom mean? To us, it's our right. We are entitled to it because we live in America. But it's not a person, place, or a thing. It's a state of being free. And these words aren't nouns, these words are ideas. 
So why do we hear the word kingdom and think of a place? The word kingdom talks about a state of being ruled over by royalty. And throughout history, kings and queens have ruled over people. Sure, they may have a territory or a plot of land that their subjects live in, but it isn't the land that they rule, it's the people. As I've mentioned many times before, with so many boys in the house, we watch a lot of, we watch a lot of Marvel movies, comic books. Um, and in one of these particular movies, Ragnarok, Thor Ragnarok, Thor is talking to Odin. And Odin has gotten old, and Thor is about to become the king of Asgard. But Thor has been told this ancient prophecy at the very beginning of the movie that foretells the impending doom of Asgard. It's Ragnarok. It's this big monster thing that's going to put his sword in, and he gets big as a house. And It's really a poor rendition of that, but... And, and Thor is asking Odin what, what it means and what he's supposed to do about it. And Odin answers with a statement that has, if you get on any kind of social media, you've probably seen the meme that has taken over the internet when this movie came out. Odin tells him, Asgard is not a place. It's a people. It's basically saying the idea of a kingdom is more important than the location. It's about the people. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, who, who knew we could learn so much from comic books? So I'm going to ask a question here, and I, and I really want to, to kind of get an answer. And at, at, when I first started to put this lesson together, I actually had this at the very beginning. So I may have, you know, given too much away, but when I say, when I ask the question, what was, what was the main theme of Jesus' teachings? If you was to go up to somebody on the street and say, what is the main theme of Jesus' teachings? I'm sure you're going to get answers like, love God, and love your neighbor. Yeah, this seems reasonable. Or maybe the golden rule, do unto others. And these are the kind of the, the things that we think about when we think of what did Jesus teach. If we go through the scriptures and boil down everything that Jesus taught, we would find that the core of his teachings was really something else. And while I believe that these answers of love your neighbor and love your God and do unto others are 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 wonderful lessons, they weren't the core of what he taught. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus, in two of the gospel accounts, starts the framework of what his entire ministry is going to be about. The first one we see in Matthew, and this is after he's been baptized and he goes into the wilderness and he comes back and in Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we see it again in Mark. Mark 1, chapter, or verse 15. And saying, The time was fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And what you're going to see is Jesus will use these words interchangeably. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, he sees them as the same thing. Now, what I want to point out, and I'm going to, to say this before I go any further, because I need everybody to understand this, it's very important. Heaven and the kingdom of heaven is not the same. These are different things saying that Washington, D.C. is the United States is an inaccurate statement. Would we agree on this? Okay? The way I like to think about it is imagine heaven 
is the capital of the kingdom of heaven. And unfortunately for many of us, we read this and we think exactly the way the religious leaders of the time of Jesus did. We say when and where. And a little fact that you may or may not know, every generation since Christ has believed they were living in the last days. We are waiting for Jesus to show back up in a cloud and establish his kingdom. We are waiting for King Jesus to make his move and end all of our troubles. And this is exactly what the people of Israel thought would happen. The Messianic king was going to come down from heaven and whip up on those big bad Romans. Then through his great power, he would rule over the earth. And you can see why they were probably a little disappointed with Jesus. And when he showed up saying, hey, it's me. And he said, well, okay, there's the Romans. He said, eh, that's not what I'm here for. Yet we get the benefit of hindsight on this idea of the kingdom. And we still think the same way they did. And Jesus is going to come and rule and end the, uh, the oppression of the earthly kingdoms. And with all that hindsight, all I can think is if we had just listened to Samuel, if we had just listened to what he said was going to happen. But Jesus... Talked about the kingdom all the time. More than 80 times in the New Testament, the kingdom is talked about. Jesus' entire ministry centers around the kingdom. While love your God and love your neighbor may be commands that all the law hangs on, but it was not the center of his ministry. This was response to the news, the good news. The gospel. Because if you remember, back here in Mark, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Again, the kingdom. Matthew 6.33 but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If we think Jesus is going to bring it back on the clouds, why is he telling us to look for it? Why is he telling us to seek it? John eighteen thirty six, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. That I, might be, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. He's saying, hey, look, this is, I'm not here to fight the Jews. I'm not here to fight the Romans. My followers are not going to be fighting. This is not going to be some big war because you're looking at this world, and that's not where my kingdom is. Luke 17, 20 and 21. Being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It's in the midst of you. Did something change? Was the kingdom of God among them, but not among us? Matthew 4.23 and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Again, it's mentioned over 80 times in the New Testament. And I personally could sit and just read them, every one of them. And I have, but I don't plan to stand here and to do that for you. I want you to read them for yourselves just know that he talks about it a lot. And aside from these small sayings, Jesus goes on a three-chapter rant about the kingdom. 
It's this little thing called the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you've heard of it. That's what that whole sermon is about. It's about the kingdom. We want Jesus to be king over our lives, thinking all of our problems will just be over if Jesus would come back and establish his kingdom. How many times have we prayed that prayer? I think we've all at least prayed it once. We want you to be, PT says it every week, the Lord of our lives. We want you to be the Lord of our lives. We want you to be our king. And all I can say is, oh, you Pharisees and Sadducees, have you not read the kingdom is in your midst? Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come in with power. Who's he talking to? Is he talking to the people that were standing there? He was talking to people when he said this. And people heard him say, You will not see death until you see the kingdom come into full power. Are there people alive today that are 2,000 years old? They're just waiting for Jesus to come back? If the answer to this simple question is obviously no, then it must have meant something else. Because not only would they see it, they would see it come with power. Did it go somewhere? Did they see it and it just disappeared? Or are we just not living in it? First Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexual homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And if we're not living in the kingdom, we just got a big clue on maybe why. And if that wasn't enough, Paul does it again. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, Sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't know about you all, but I'm, I've got a feeling that every single one of us can find ourselves in these verses. And I'll be, you know, I, I, I'm, I'll, I'll quickly point at myself. Fits of anger. That's probably the easiest one to just go ahead and admit to. If the power of the kingdom isn't present in our lives, then maybe we should check on what we are practicing. And I know all this sounds harsh. Please don't think I'm talking down to anyone or trying to put myself on a pedestal. I'm not walking around adjusting my halo and living out this perfect kingdom life. However, we need to ask God to search our hearts and reveal the wickedness in all of us. Because you see, living in ignorance is not an excuse anymore. We don't get to say we didn't know. Sorry if I just ruined that for you. Sorry if you didn't know and I just pointed it out. You know and you can never unknow it. We are called to be a holy people, separate, under the kingship of God. Royal priests for the nations to see who he is. And our mission is to preach the gospel 
So, you know, while we're doing a little bit of word study, while we're at it, I want to ask this, what's the gospel? And until really just recently, I, I, I would have given the answer that I'm pretty sure most Christians are going to give. What is the gospel? Jesus, crucified, buried, and resurrected for the forgiveness of our sins. Yeah? When we say go preach the gospel, this is what we think, right? You can be reconciled to God through the resurrection of Jesus and through his blood and through his sacrifice. That's the gospel, right? When we hear the phrase, teach and preach the gospel, we usually think about that. We think forgiveness of sins and reconciliation. If this is true, why did Jesus say he came to preach the gospel? There had been no death, burial, and resurrection. And yet Jesus is walking around saying, I'm here preaching the gospel. And when we start to study this word and we start to look at it from an ancient Hebrew's point of view, what you find is that this idea of gospel is completely different than what we thought. The word gospel greatly relates to the kingdom. The word gospel signifies good news of a new reign of a king. The kingdom that Jesus was speaking of was the gospel. This idea that, hey, the king is here. A new king has arrived. Isaiah, it was talked about in Isaiah. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. There's your kingdom. The good news, the gospel kingdom. This was the mission of Jesus' earthly ministry. Through his sacrifice, we have access to that kingdom. But before we were granted that access, he spent three years telling us about it. And it's in those gospels. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to taste death until I see that kingdom come into full power. I want to experience that in my life. And I would encourage, and hopefully you would want to experience that in your life. I want to experience the reign of God in me and in my home. That's what Jesus was talking about. It's not of this world. It's in the midst. It's within you. Let God be your king. I want to see God lived out and that kingdom lived out and those around me. And so I'm just going to say this to you. Your God reigns. This is also not going to be in those slides. We live in a free country. Yes? Simple answer. We have freedom. Right? Can I go down to the local school and sell crack cocaine? But I thought we were free. So I can't, I can't do that. What happens if I do? I'm going to go to jail. And as I'm sitting in my prison cell for trying to sell crack cocaine to a great schooler, am I free? Am I experiencing the great republic of the United States? I am not. And while I am not trying to compare the two things, 
There, there can be a parallel drawn from this. If we are doing the things that Paul told us will not inherit the kingdom, then it doesn't matter. You're not going to enjoy the kingdom that's here. The same as if I break the rules of this country and I sit in a prison cell, I'm not going to enjoy the freedom that it provides. Make sense? So this is the challenge I'm going to give everybody this week. Study the kingdom. Read every piece of scripture that pertains to it. It's beautiful. And begin to understand what Jesus was actually talking about. And when we understand, then our response should be the commands that he gave us to love God and love our neighbor. It's the response to the kingdom within us. When he rules over our heart, we reject the kingdoms of this world that teach us, just do you. Do what makes you happy. But it's you versus them. That's what the kingdoms of the world tell you. And when it's me versus you, somebody's getting oppressed. And we talked about it last week. God hates oppression. And I love that last verse that I read just a minute ago. I love it so much. I want to read it again. So if you're, if you're taking notes, you want something to hang on the fridge, you want a tweetable quote, it doesn't come from me. It's this. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, who establishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Let God establish his kingdom in you. Let him reign over your life. And then we can be part of that kingdom. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Let's pray. Oh, well. Could we say that Jesus is the kingdom? You want to elaborate a little bit? Well, he says it's, it's at hand, it's here. It's at hand, it, it is here. He was talking about himself. In the midst among you, repent and believe. That's how we get into relationship with him. And because of the death and resurrection and the Holy Spirit, we can be not just with God, but God in us, in him. That's fair. Yeah. Him is a state of you go back to the state of being. Or I mean, it can be it, it, it can be a um, a state of being king. Is the king? Okay. Now, if we're all going to have a conversation here, we got to turn the microphone on. We can have a conversation, but and the people on Facebook would maybe like to hear the conversation as well. I, I, I had, <laughs> I had a, a, a book that I was reading this week, and I, it's a really good book. But um, this lady was trying to witness to her mother, and throughout her whole life, her mother was, she was an atheist. She didn't believe in God. And at one point in time, the, the lady didn't uh, as well. But she ended up becoming a Christian, and um, her mom was a feminist, very strong-minded woman, lots of strength, but her, her mind was messed up. Like, she had a anxiety and depression and, and all kinds of other stuff that came along with it. Like, as throughout her whole life, I mean, she just warred. She was mad. She was angry. But she felt that she was never weak, and she thought that her daughter was weak because she gave in to that of becoming a Christian and becoming weak, right? 
So um, it was on her deathbed that uh, she was in hospice and her daughter just sat with her and her and her children and her, her husband would come in, read Psalms and sing to her, you know, and it opened up to others within the place. And she finally came to the point where she was like, you don't have to worry about me anymore. I've made things right with God, you know, and she did. She gave her life to God, but she said, I've become weak now. And it's through our weakness that he can be strong, you know, I, for so long, we, we try to be God, you know, we, we had, that's, that's the whole thing. We are not God, but yet we try to be God because there's this place, this thing that's missing within us. And we're trying to fill it up with all these things that we think that the way that, that the hierarchy of the way that our lives are supposed to be, the way that we are supposed to be and how that we're supposed to be strong. But it's, Jesus Christ came to flip all that on top of its head to say that, you know, it's exactly opposite of the way that you've been thinking the whole time. I mean, the kingdom is here. I've come. Yes, Jesus came to fulfill that Christ in us so that he could be God in our lives, so that we could have the kingdom of God. And it, it was just beautiful because that's that's what I saw. You know, it it was just a a beautifully painted picture of humanity mm-hmm. and what we're missing and what we need. I just thought it was neat. And it is kind of a in our thinking a, a very upside down kingdom. You know, don't don't centralize your army. Don't. Uh, don't don't depend on yourself. Don't try to be strong. Be weak. Let me reign. That's basically what God is telling us. And yeah, it is, it is through our weakness that we find the source of our greatest strength. And it's not our strength. It's His. Anything else? All right, let's close with some prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray that we can experience you more. That we seek you out. And I know, Lord, that this is not a prayer that you can grant, that we have to do it on our own. And Lord, I don't know about anybody else, but the desire of my heart is to know you. And to be known by you. And I can't understand what we are, who we are, that you take the time to think about us. But I thank you that you do. And Lord, I just pray that as we leave out of here, that we can have a peace and we can let you reign our lives. That we can let you rule where we think we should. And that through that, we can have the fruit of the Spirit. And through that fruit, the world can see who you are. That it reflects your glory and your love. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.